Hey guys, welcome to what I think is episode number three on this 0017 Martin from 1947. Um, I've got a playlist going on. If this is the first glimpse of this guitar you're getting, you're going to want to go up there, hover your mouse, there'll be an eye pop up, and there's a playlist. That playlist includes um, the first episode when we brought this guitar in, the bridge was coming up, and so the body was coming up, and we used some odd techniques and even built a whole body press to level out flat tops. Um, I think you might find that interesting. In the second episode, we went in and tried to deal with some of the grain separation cracks and even splits on this guitar with good result. Now this one is about a little bit bigger problem inside. There is a split brace in here. It's not cracked, it's not loose. It is split and the way that it has split is very interesting to me as a tree guy. Now just because I'm a tree guy or an arborist or whatever, just because I've got some knowledge of risk management and managing large populations of trees to protect the public and, and all that goes with the tree. That doesn't mean I'm a dendrologist or a, a wood specialist or a structural engineer or um, a guitar builder that understands the nuances of some woods when it comes to producing sound with a guitar. If I had to pick one of those things that I'm probably better at, it's looking at a whole tree and determining what it's likely to do uh, when it's put under a load and whether or not it's pretty much safe to the public. That all adds up with some of my crane and oil field and, and rigging and, and, and who knows what into this really <laughs> loose science that I've extrapolated together. Anyway, there's a brace in here that we really need to fix because it's right under where the structural integrity of this is going to be. Um, we're going to have to get that done and then looking ahead we've got that to fix and then we can get into the fine tuning of the finish and making this look presentable for all the repairs we've done. I am enjoying working on this guitar but I can't do that if I keep talking. We're going to get into some structural stuff here and I like that. So let's take a look inside this guitar the best way we can. I'll explain to you what I see and then we'll go to work fixing it. And we're going to have kind of an interesting conversation about wood, how it works, how it's put together, and how trees protect themselves from decay that's trying to spread through the entire system. Let's get to the bench. Okay, we are doing this through a mirror and you can see right in the middle of the frame, there is the X brace that goes across, you see there, and then right to the center of where they all come attached right there is a split. And you'll notice that there's rings on the top of the split about five millimeters apart. Those represent annual growth rings, but we'll draw this out. This is where the split is. Now we can get some glue in there and I will be using tight bond this time because I don't need anything to heat up and have hide glue cut loose. But that split right there is what we need to fix. That split being there will allow the soundboard or the top of the guitar in the area of the brace to do the opposite of what it was doing before and that was rising up. This would cause it to sink in so we need to get that split fixed. Let me get a jack in there and glue it up and I'll take another picture. Alright, we've got that little jack in there and we got some tight bond into that split. Sorry, the camera is a little bit shaky here. But notice that at the end of the jack is where the split was. Now it's glued together. I want you to notice that coming along that rib or brace, whatever you want to call it, 
there appears to be a pattern like a raccoon tail that goes from the ridge of the brace at the bottom and goes up to where it attach, attaches to the soundboard or bottom of the top of the guitar. Let's talk about what that is. All right, guys, let's take a look at some wood theory. I'm calling it theory because it's pretty simple stuff and everybody might not believe it. This is a branch or a young tree. Now, we're gonna to wanna to take a look at how this is built. So we're gonna put a little bit of linseed oil on it so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. I've put some saw marks in this, so that's not gonna help us a whole lot. By the way, when you're working with boiled linseed oil and rags, you do not wanna leave the rags laying around wadded up because stuff is an oxidizer. It will light up. Anyway, how apropos that we have a Lorax book the savior of the trees here for this. Anyway, this is kind of related to my day job, like significantly. So, I think you all know trees well enough to understand that there are a series of tubes. I'm going to be drawn upside down here for your benefit, which will cause me to struggle. But anyway, we have rings. You know what these rings are. You've seen them when you cut radially or across the trunk or branch. You see that? So these rings are like this. So let's take a look at the rings. On one side of the ring is the water conducting tissue. On the other side is the assimilate conducting tissue. This is the stuff that is made by sunlight, starch, and sugars. This is water. This ring separates them. That occurs with every ring. So, you know what a steel pipe is. You know that steel pipes are hollow in the middle. Remember that. They will still hold weight even though they are hollow in the middle. You see that. Okay, so... The tree has these rings, like so. And in between this way and this way are what are called ray cells. These are very pronounced in pines and conifers. They'll open up, they look like the sun. Now, in between the rings, like so, are these little tissues called parenchyma cells. They unload water and starch. So depending on how much water and starch is in one of these cells, and there are literally billions and zillions of them. There are so many that you need Carl Sagan to tell you how many there are. But they are everywhere. And sometimes they call this ground tissue. So depending on how much water and starch use potassium iodide, these will stain, by the way, if you macerate this tissue under a microscope, and you'll need a little bit bigger one than this uh, currency detecting microscope that I'm going to talk about in other episodes. Don't forget about that or the tool that I made to use it. Anyway, it stands to reason that if the tree is drying out, these will shrink based on the amount of water and starch that's in them. By the way, if you macerate this tissue and you find it under a microscope and you want to know what the waters look like and looking like in the tree, the parenchyma cells are the best way to tell you. And if they're shrinking, they're shaped in a way that causes them to plasmolify or shrink down like this. So if you bounce the fine-tuning of the microscope and you glance this edge and it comes back at you and you can see it glittering, that means it's faceted like a class ring or something, meaning that there's less water in this one than in this one. Now, I want you to think about this. 
let's say you've got all these billions of cells in here, each one of these and a billion more are these parenchyma cells, and they start to dry out. These cells are going to open up. Likewise, when the parenchyma cells load up with water and get bigger, these will close. So the ray cells are capable of moving this way and this way, and they act kind of like as a shock absorber now. People don't know this very much, but you see these limbs falling off in the middle of summer, and they say, oh, it's summer limb drop. Well, guess what? If these ray cells, which are here, here, and here, open up too much, their weakest point is out here at the edge of the trunk or branch. So if these open up, this is going to cause this whole thing to fail, and it's usually a twist failure. You'll see something that looks like a wrung-out dish rag. So when your arborist tells you it just jumped off the tree, remember, pines are good at not taking up in wa water in the winter or in the summer because the storms and the snow and stuff is in spring and that kind of stuff. So if you're drowning your pines in the middle of the summer and then you wonder why they're pathogenic, I don't know what to tell you. Okay, so while we're here, I want to talk about something called codic compartmentalization of decay in trees. And this is going to be very revealing for us because trees are able to compart. This is the trunk. This is axially. This is radially. Okay. So trees are able to stop decay coming in, moving out, moving up and down, and moving around. Let's say something here. The ray cells are responsible for this zone. The rings in the tree are responsible for the in and out. But what's responsible for the up and down? Well, there's on trees what we call lenisols, on branches, or branches. Now, if you take all the lower branches off of a tree, trees grow by putting wood on each year in circles. If these are gone, there's no reason to put more wood on right there. And so, the taper of the tree stays small versus how it is supposed to be. This is the classic with these buttress roots that come out, etc. Now, the weakest one of these zones, which one do you think it is? Is it the rings? Is it the ray cells? Or the sunburst you see inside when you make a cut like this? No, it's this one. It's the up and down between the branches. So, what's the weakest cut you can make in a tree? Well, you're going across the rings, you're going across the ray cells, and in small wood, it's that one. So, what would that look like? Well, if we cut this way and there's rings, it would look like this. But if you cut that at an angle, and it presented at an angle, it might appear like this. See that? What do we see inside that brace? Do we not see this telltale angle tiger stripe looking thing? That's it. If I were to pick up a piece of wood and make a brace out of it and I were looking down at it, I would not be looking for this to be ideal. In fact, if I were looking at several different guitars that had bracing inside that I could see with a a mirror, etc. This would be my last choice. Now, I want to show you something. The tree, being a column of one pipe after another, can take a great deal of stress. This way, you've seen people stand on cans, whatever. We're going to do a little experiment here. This is not the best angle, but I'm going to push down on the scan as hard as I can. It's fine until I do that. 
Does that kind of look like how that brace failed? Think about it, guys. You tell me. Now, there's a luthier I watch in Canada. He did a video about, he did an episode about a Martin arch top. Martin made a lot of arch tops. They were a big chunk of their sales in the 30s. I'm going to show you an episode right up there right about now. And this luthier says that Martin was very, very conscientious about how they braced their arch tops and said that they were under tension, that the bracing put the top under tension, like those dogs that are howling out there. They're actually Siberian or Northern Hemisphere dogs that don't bark. They howl. Maybe they are taking exception to what I'm saying here. But in any event, I'm wondering if some of this bracing wasn't put in very selectively and wasn't hand chosen. That's something I'll never know. I'm sure that's a Martin secret. I've seen what their work looks like inside. I'm becoming more familiar with it. And I don't think that they were picking materials to save money or to set up structural deficits that would fail in 2023. Anyway, think about this. I would like to know if that top being under tension related to the braces versus depending on the arch of a carved top. I wonder what that means in terms of all this. I'm done. We're going to leave that Martin sit over there and continue to dry up. Yeah, I used tight bond on that one. So what do you think about all this theory I just threw at you? Isn't that impressive for somebody that goes out and hacks the limbs off of trees on the weekends? <laughs> Guys, do you know where tree topping came from? That's not the way you trim trees. It's not in nature's design or, or that person that you pray to and you get so drunk you can't get yourself off the floor. It wasn't his or her or whatever's design for trees to outgrow themselves to the point where we have to come along and hack the whole top off. That wasn't the idea. No. This idea about topping trees was done very carefully. Uh, I believe in England, I don't know, maybe ask Gebernick, he was there when it started, I think. Anyway, you would come down to a branch collar, which means there's a branch growing out, and you would cut the tree there, not just in the middle and leave a bunch of stubs, but what would happen is the tree would have some what they call adventitious sucker growth, and it would go out very small, weakly attached because it's adventitious growth. It comes off of a latent bud. I explained that to you back there. Listen, blame me because you failed the test. I'm not responsible for you getting a bad grade and a bad Christmas or birthday present. That's on you, Padna. Anyway, so all these weakly attached branches would grow out every year. And every year they come back and cut to the exact same spot. Why? because that small stuff was perfect for kindling in grandma's wood stove in the 1400s or even before. Again, ask Gabernick, he'll be able to shed some light on that for you. Yeah, when you mess around with a tree's design, it's gonna fight back. It may attack your car, it may attack your house, it may attack you. I'll see ya. Think about that, or don't. Probably better if you don't. We'll be doing some more work on that, Martin. We've got a hole to fix, and we're finally going to put the bridge back on that thing. I will see you soon.